to demonstrate um, the capability of that um, device and about assays that we perform at TwoBind, I wanted to show you um, a screen using P38, uh, a known kinase, um, and 80 known kinase inhibitors. First of all, why P38? Yeah, because uh, it's a perfect model system. There are many, many crystal structures available. The signal transduction pathway is more or less completely understood. Um, it's very known about everything about where P38 is involved in, in cellular processes like proliferation, metabolism, and so on. And there are a lot of described small molecule inhibitors. So this tool is a quiet night model system, and that's why we have used it. And the idea about this screening is simply that kinase inhibitors very often have off targets. So they are designed to bind a specific kinase, the on target, but suddenly they show off target effects. And we were interested in, interested in the fact if out of those 80 known kinase inhibitors, there are some which have P38 as off target. Uh, of course, we had a kind of expectation um, that this will happen. And I think I will not spoil it too much to say that this indeed happened. So there are some kinase inhibitors that have P38 as off target. This is the screening process. How does it look like? So we start with a short sample QC of P38 and then the assay is developed. We start with a ligand demobilization establishment followed by positive control establishment. And after we have done that, um, the ligand library has to be spotted into the different formats uh, using lab site echo spotting, um, either into the wave rapid format um, or into the hit validation format with multi-cycle kinetics that we aim to do. Here's the sample QC step. So we have used nanoDSF, um, which is a thermal unfolding uh, measurement type which tells you the thermal stability of the protein of P38. And we have done that in uh, without DMSO and uh, with 5% DMSO, which was the assay concentration. And here on the left side, you see an unfolding profile in the ratio 350 to 330 nanometers. You can see that in the dashed lines that there's clearly um, two very nice unfolding um, transitions. And uh, we end up at 51 or 52 per uh, degree Celsius, depending on the presence of DMSO. So this tells us the protein is quite fine. Just as a comment, um, there's also other options to do more QC. Uh, in this case, it was not needed. Coming to the ligand immobilization, which is uh, one of the most important steps um, in, uh, in the complete process. Um, here, one should really think about um, the target and what the target is about, what it may be harmed of, um, and what it tolerates, and so on. And there are several aspects that we need to consider for P38 immobilization. So first of all, it's known that P38 is sensitive to pH shifts. And this is a problem for classical amine coupling. So the concentration uh, via um, uh, a pH uh, below the isoelectric point of a protein may simply harm the protein um, when it's um, on the surface or when it uh, gets attached. So this is a problem that we need to overcome. And therefore, we have chosen a combination of his capturing the protein uh, and then amine coupling. This allows us to do the immobilization at pH 8 which is for P38, obviously the better choice. And the second thing that we need to consider is the fact that a lot of kinase inhibitors are active site binders. Um, P38, as quite a lot of kinases, um, contains an, an, act, an, an important lysine in, in the active site. And if we do amine coupling, we do that via lysine. So there is a chance that potentially we might uh, harm the important lysine, which is in the active site. And to overcome that, we have saturated P38 with an active site binder before capturing and coupling, and also during. And in this way, we can protect the lysine, and after the immobilization is done, we can simply exclude the active site binder by 
injections of buffer, washing it out basically. So this is uh, the immobilization protocol that we have used for this his capturing amine coupling uh, a protocol. So we activated uh, the nickel surface with the nickel ions, then uh, with EDC NHS we activate the surface for the amine coupling and then injected uh, P38 in repeated injections uh, for the his capturing amine coupling um, to a density that we uh, calculated um, upfront. Passivation of the ex, um, activated carboxymethylene groups uh, is with ethanolamine. Nickel ions are um, removed by EDTA pulse um, because we know that uh, nickel might have an effect on compound binding and we want to get rid of it before the screening. So in the end, we come up with a nice coupling efficiency and density. Um, so we're really happy about this. And uh, later positive controls also showed us that the ligand activity um, on the surface is determined to be roughly 80%, which is quite nice. Um, we are really happy about that. Just as a side note, um, we also tried the classical standard amine coupling without um, blocking of P38 with a compound, and we ended up with below 10% of um, uh, ligand activity. And this basically already underlines that uh, a thorough, uh, you know, thinking about ligand immobilization is really needed um, to get proper results, specifically for um, a screening approach. Next point is, of course, uh, after ligand immobilization is the positive control establishment. So we've started with a compound called SB203580, which is described in a publication using SPR multicycle kinetics um, to have a kinetic KD of 12 nanomolar. And uh, in the GCI, we end up um, with uh, 37 nanomolar in the uh, KD out of the kinetics equilibrium KD comes up with 45 nanomolar. So quite comparable, I would say. The um, rapid um, shows us a kinetic uh, KD of 41 nanomolar, also quite in line with the multi-cycle kinetics. Um, to judge the quality of data, um, it's also quite important, specifically for multi-cycle kinetic um, analysis, to, to check the off rates and how they follow um, the dose response. And as you see here in the middle graph, um, the dose response is nicely followed. Um, so we can be quite happy about um, the quality of those data. It's quite homogeneous also how, it, how the, the, the curves come together. The second uh, control that we tried was of the same series SB, but 202190. In the multi-cycle, we end up with 40 um, nanomolar uh, kinetic KD. From wave rapid data on the right, we end up with 49 nanomolar, also comparable. The difference here is that the quality is not as good as for the control before. Hence, we decided for the control before. Nevertheless, um, just to give you also another control that we tried, it's BURB 796. And interestingly, this guy here has a very slow off rate, as you can see. It does not get rid of the surface, um, at least in that time frame. And it's uh, also described to have a half-life of something like 23 uh, hours. So this is not a proper control for what we want to do. It's a binder, but it's not a proper control. OK, so to be sure that the screening that you have done um, is really valid and that the results can be trusted, um, we, of course, measured also the control during the screen um, in total nine times. And there are two, um, let's say, factors that can tell you if the assay is properly performed or if the, if the protein is active or the complete process of the screening, which is surface activity and the binding affinity of the positive controls. Um, for both, we are quite happy. So surface activity uh, dropped mildly from 80 to 50 percent. 50 percent is still quite high, so we are really happy about that. And even more important, the binding affinity of those nine measurements, as shown here, um, was basically not changed. So the average, average affinity of all measured controls was 61.4 plus minus 2.3 nanomolar. So um, we can uh, be happy and, and uh, satisfied that the assay is valid and we can trust the data that we have produced. 
So out of these 80 compounds, um, we found 87% uh, non-binders, 4% promiscuous binders, and 9% hits. And I will walk you through examples of each of those categories now. So for, first, let's start with non-binders. There are three examples, um, wave rapid data in the top, raw data in the lower part, and in none of them you can see any dissociation. Um, this means there is no binding. I'm, this, I think, explains enough. And then we have the category uh, promiscuous binders. Um, here, these guys, they are clearly non-specific binders to the matrix. As you can see in the raw data, um, both bind reference and P38 surface in the same extent, um, meaning they simply bind the matrix. Um, it's unspecific. And then we have a quite interesting one. Um, so this one, we classified it as a non-specific binder to the protein. How we, do we come to that conclusion? I mean, in the first place, uh, it binds to the P38 surface and not to the reference or not, not too much. Um, meaning it could also speak for a normal binder. But if you look at the wave data, uh, in general, uh, there's a very slow on and basically no visible off. So the, it, this, this doesn't uh, really uh, fit to a classical binder. In addition, when you compare the signal of um, that experiment to the overall screening data, the signal is rather high. So we Therefore, we conclude that it's potentially a non-specific binder, and we think that this compound might aggregate, but the aggregates are present in rather low concentrations and bind unspecifically to the protein. This is a hypothesis, um, sure no proof, that's clear. We simply need more experiments, um, but um, I think um, this hypothesis could make sense. Then we have a bunch of different binders, as you can see here in wave rapid data. Um, in all of them, you can see a nice dissociation um, in, in, in the wave rapid. And we have uh, taken uh, those guys and validated them with multi-cycle kinetics. So just as a very important information upfront, um, the screening approach with wave rapid was done at 50 micromolar. So this is the concentration that you keep to have to keep in mind. <clears throat> and in the multi-cycle kinetics, um, we basically adjusted the concentration according to the wave um, data. And you can see that there is um, other concentration used on the left side. Um, so it's for the upper one, it starts at 200, for the, the lower one at 100. Nevertheless, the data look quite fine. So we end up with low micromolar um, KD kinetics and equilibrium. Um, uh, for both of those guys, again, uh, when you zoom into the dissociation, the dissociation follows nicely, um, the dose response, so nice data. Same goes for this uh, colleague here, um, triple digit uh, nanomolar affinity, um, also nice data. And then there are some quite interesting uh, guys coming up. First, this one here, um, we have classified it as binder but it seems that this compound is aggregating from a certain concentration, meaning concentration-dependent aggregator. How do we come to that um, conclusion? In the left uh, part, um, so the multi-cycle um, data, you see a black line, which um, is the expected Rmax, which is calculated by the molecular weight of the compound and the surface activity and density. And you can see that quite a number of um, uh, data signals are above this threshold. And this already indicates that it's definitely not a one-to-one -one situation and uh, it's not stoichiometric. Furthermore, also the shape of the curves and um, some other aspects quite indicate that this is an aggregation uh, problem here. Still, we think that this is a binder because when you look at a lower concentration um, of this compound in this assay, it quite follows a one-to-one -one interaction and it's still reversible. Um, so, of course, there's no saturation reached and therefore we uh, call it an apparent kinetic um, KD um, of roughly 70 micromolar. But I think that's an interesting um, candidate and it, it tells us what kind of information you can get out of GCI. But I think that one is maybe even more interesting. So. 
Again, I want to remind you that we have screened at 50 micromolar and uh, WaveRapid has identified this as a hit, which is um, for that concentration also, um, it's, it's true. But if you have a closer look, you can see um, that there's again um, a, a problem with, with aggregation, um, which you can see in the multi-cycle kinetic data on the left with the highest concentration. At least there's some weird things going on, but which but very obviously it's in the raw data. So here um, the signal increases quite intensely with the concentration. And uh, in addition to that, um, it's clearly uh, obvious that the uh, molecule at high concentration binds to the reference surface and the P38 surface. Um, same goes for when, when you look at smaller, uh, low concentrations, it's kind of reversible, yes, but it's still multiphasic and very likely non-specific. And this means we have classified this one as a non-specific binder and also concentration dependent aggregator. Again, we have a kind of a theory without any proof. We need to do a lot more experiments, but if you look at the structure of this molecule, it looks like a lipid, like a tensid, like, you know, detergent and it could be that this uh, molecule forms kind of micelles at a certain CMC or above a certain concentration. And those micelles could then potentially um, aggregate and bind to uh, the surface of um, uh, which is, is presented, whatever it is, so reference or, or P38 surface. Again, theory, we need more experiments, but I think it's interesting that what kind of information you can get out of such um, data. So um, to sum up, um, I think it's important to say that we, we have a nicely established assay. We found interesting hits. We found off-target um, P38 to be off-targets of some kinase inhibitors. We found uh, non-binders, promiscuous binders. But as well, it's important about um, to say um, what's the consumption we had, how many chips do we need, um, how long did it, did it take us, and so on. And here's a little summary. Um, for you guys out there. So in the sample QC, um, we used um, five micrograms of the protein and took us roughly a day. Um, <clears throat> in acidf it's 10 micrograms of protein and a microliter of the control a compound stock. We consumed a chip in two days. Um, same goes for HIT ID. Also, again, 10 micrograms protein, um, one microliter of the control compound stock and two microliters of the inhibitor stock. Again, one chip, two days. Hit validation, another 10 microgram protein, one microliter again of the control compounds for validation, and um, six microliters for the inhibitor stocks. Also one chip, two days. And to sum up for that screen, uh, it took us 35 micrograms protein, three microliters of the controls, eight microliters of the compound, and three chips, seven days. Um, it's it's the, the screen contained QC, assay development, hit ID, and also hit validation.